Brooks will now speak to a seasoned climatologist to help us unpack the adverse weather conditions that have gripped the country. With heavy showers, severe thunderstorms and damaging winds expected in several provinces, Simon Gale will provide insights into what this means for residents, how to stay safe and what we can expect in the coming days. We'll also explore how this rainfall compares to previous seasons, what the implications are for water resources in the region and how South Africa's dam systems are managing the influx. Welcome to the show, Simon. Appreciate your time. Now, what is causing these severe weather conditions and how long are they expected to last? So there is, um, we, we do have a slightly La Nina system at the moment. That's the um, uh, Pacific Oscillation that causes about 30% of our variability in rainfall. Um, so that's certainly working in, in our favor in terms of having heavy rain. Other than that, it's just been one of these periods where there's been a, um, a very stable trough that's laying over the central parts of the country, and that's brought a lot of rain uh, to the eastern parts. And just how much rain have we received this rainy season compared to previous years? Um, so it's difficult to get a sort of holistic story all, all the way across, but certainly um, during that very wet four or five days um, uh, that Johannesburg experienced, I mean, that was well north of 100 millimetres of rain. Um, so that would have been an entire month's worth of rain that fell in about three or four days. Um, and that's been replicated all over the country. And, um, you know, certainly everywhere, um, you know, across the summer rainfall region is looking green and, and quite soggy. So what areas are most at risk? Obviously KZN. I mean, we, we've been talking about flooding in KZN in the, in the last few weeks. Uh, are there other areas across the country that are also in danger and uh, areas where residents need to be uh, particularly careful? The communities that are at risk are usually um, the semi-rural areas, uh, you know, so communities that are reliant on uh, just a couple of bridges to be able to get around. So a lot of communities in the Eastern Cape, that's often a problem. KZN, quite similar. Uh, and KwaZulu-Natal has the problem that their infrastructure gets battered every two or three years. Mm. Um, and it's very, very difficult for them to keep up with uh, the damage that gets done every time that there is a big rainfall event. And, and you know, intermittent heavy rain is, is fairly normal for KwaZulu-Natal. Um, but when there have been uh, really big events, certainly in the last decade or so, um, there is a sense that maybe the infrastructure rebuild hasn't quite caught up. And so you get communities that are now uh, more easily isolated, more easily likely to take risks um, in flooding conditions, which obviously results uh, often in injury and death. Uh, over the rest of the country, um, so there has been damage in, in certain areas of Johannesburg. And, um, you know, again, that's going to take quite a while to um, to fix again. I know the community in the area that I live has quite a few dirt roads. And um, and literally the local you know people who live here have had to get, get around to actually fixing those roads on their own um, just because uh, the municipality is so overloaded. So, uh, yeah, there are certainly isolated areas that are more severely impacted. Uh, but generally, I'd say Kwazulu Natal and probably the rural communities there are the most heavily affected. So let, let's shift focus a little bit and, and, and look at what this rain could mean for regional water resources, particularly for critical systems, uh, not just in South Africa, but uh, across the, the SADC region. Uh, one of those areas that's of particular interest is the Kariba Dam in uh, Zimbabwe and Zambia. And we know that Zambia, for, for periods, has been going at 19, 20 hours without electricity because the, the dam uh, is not catching any water. Are they likely to, to benefit uh, from this at all? To be honest, I'm not sure to what extent this rain has, has um, fallen uh, up in the northern parts of uh, the Static region. Um, the catchment area for Kariba is uh, large parts of central and uh, northern Zimbabwe and then you know much of, of, of Zambia and out into Angola as well. Uh, so it is quite a long way from where this rain has been falling. Mm. Uh, but you're quite right. Um, you know, countries like Zambia, where they have to, um, you, you know, they, they don't they don't have a lot of um, fail safes for things like their their um, their electricity infrastructure. Uh, a full Kariba Dam is always going to be of of use to them. So, so let's talk. Let's bring it back home and look at how South Africa is managing the increased water levels uh, in its dams. And you know, in places like like the Vaal, for instance. Yeah, so the Vaal is, I think, essentially full now, and um, it uh, will continue to be uh, topped up by the rain that's falling over the uh, northern Free State and large parts of the Mpumalanga High Fault. 
still talk us to have a wet few days ahead of it. Um, which means that, um, you know, the, the sluice gates can be open and there can be plenty of water flowing down the river itself. Uh, but also, uh, it means that that water resource is, is available uh, to farmers and um, uh, to a lesser extent to, to Karteng. Most of the rain for Karteng, uh, for uh, the water for Karteng actually comes from the Lusitio Highlands water scheme, which um, uh, will also be topped up by this. And the implications of uh, opening those uh, floodgates downstream? Uh, anything for us to, to worry about? Anything that uh, residents in low-lying areas should look out for? It's it's generally done in a very managed way. Mm. Uh, so if there is going to be um, a storm surge, uh, you know the the water uh, uh, boards will will warn residents uh, downriver that that is the case. As it is, quite a lot of water flows through that system. Um, so whenever you drive along the ball, uh, it, it, it always looks quite full. You know, if you go past sort of Blumhoff and those sort of areas, there's a lot of dams. So they don't get um, uh, sort of flood and dry patterns on, the, on those dams any longer. It's a very controlled river, uh, which has its own problems. Um, but, uh, yeah, I wouldn't anticipate that there would be a sort of flood issues uh, mm. downstream from the Vaal. Um, You know, that's part of the benefits of a dam is that it does um, mitigate that. As a climat climatologist, Simon, just how much are you able to, to forecast about these weather patterns? And is it is the sort of rain that we're receiving during this period likely to stay with us? I mean, are, are we going to see it next year and the, and the year after? You can't, really, you can't forecast um, that far out. Um, well, you can forecast in different ways. Hmm. So um, obviously we do our climate change forecasting, which is about modelling the whole earth. And uh, you, can, you can make educated guesses about how the weather's going to change over the next 100 years uh, based on, on, on changing things like the CO2 level. Um, for day-to-day -day weather, uh, you can't really forecast with much accuracy beyond about 10 weeks to, uh, sorry, 10 days to um, two weeks. Um, and then you can do a seasonal forecast where you look at things like, well, is the season going to be wetter than average or drier than average? Mm. Uh, so um, a number of those things have aligned to, um, you know, be, be able to correctly forecast this rain. Um, but whether you can then extrapolate out and say, well, is that going to mean two or three years of, of rain? Um, no, you can't really do that. So when, when we start talking about global warming and, and, and climate change, so how, how do we determine the impact of global warming and climate change if, if our forecasts are that restricted? I mean, how do we, how do we prepare for the implications of global warming, particularly in areas like, uh, like KZN? If we go back to 2022 and those uh, devastating floods, uh, for instance, we, we didn't see them coming, but over the last few years, there's almost been a, a regular supply of water that's uh, reached um, those sort of uh, levels. Yeah, so you can't, in a climate change sense, you can't um, forecast individual rain events. That's not how it works. Mm. But you can certainly forecast patterns. And so if you go, uh, the CSIR has a very, very good website. Uh, if you put Green Book into uh, your Google, you can go and play around and have a look at what the global for the, the climate change forecast is for your local municipality. And almost all of those municipalities across the Pomalanga Highfelt, across KZN, they have two patterns. One is that um, a climate change uh, environment, global warming environment, will um, make them slightly wetter uh, than they currently are. But the big difference is that there will be far more heavy rain events. So there'll be more rain and it'll be more variable. And uh, that certainly seems to be the future that we're living in. And finally, to, to your knowledge, just how much of this information are local municipalities taking into account? And again, the question goes back to the issues that we're witnessing, the pictures that we're seeing on our, on our screens at the moment where there is flooding uh, in specific areas in the KZN and the Eastern Cape across the country. And this, this incident has, or these incidents have been happening uh, regularly, at least over the last uh, two or three years. Look, there's certainly no excuse for them not being aware of um, the the forecasts. Um, that's you know that's widely available. Um, whether they act on them, whether it's one of their priorities, uh, I can't really speak to that at all. I think some municipalities probably prepare themselves better than others, and um, and a lot of that will have to do with the resources available to the local municipality and uh, the efficiency with which they spend that money. Uh, but certainly, any municipality in KZN. Uh, that is not adequately 
um, planning for flooding is a miss because, I mean, you don't have to live in KZN to know that that is a high-risk area. That's really that conversation. Simon Gear, climatologist, appreciate your time. Thank you so much for speaking to us and just putting it out there that uh, indeed this global warming and the challenges around weather will be with us uh, for some time to come.